Um, all right. Welcome to 2018. It is so far a very good year, but I am going to talk about something from a long, long time ago, the land before time. And I'm going to talk about this thing called Mac OS development. It's pretty awesome, I love it. And my journey so far. So, hi, I'm Matt. Um, for those that don't know me, I work for Baloo. I've worked at a few different places, but now I'm working for Baloo, which is a really, really good consultancy in Sydney and Melbourne, but I'm not here to talk about that. Tonight, I have this thing, a lightning talk. No one complained. Notorious, <laughs> man. <laughs> yep. <laughs> okay. Yep. I thought I thought I'd put a new tiny thing into a test. Yeah, so everything either succeeds wonderfully or fails based on my talk. Yay. Um, I am looking at the clock, so I will do my best to actually make sure that this is a lightning talk, um, scouts honour, all that stuff. First, a bit of a caveat. What I say has every chance of being wrong. Um, I am very new to this macOS thing. I've attempted it a few times in the past, but ultimately, I tend to fail at this because it is very different from iOS. Why am I giving this talk? I'm giving this talk for two things, mainly for a very selfish and personal reasons. I want to consolidate what it is that I've learnt and I want to actually try and demystify this whole thing around AppKit. Fairly ambitious. Okay, getting started. This is the one very, very big hurdle that everyone has to get up, get over. And compared to the wonderful world of iOS, macOS has a very large hurdle to get over. It's not as well documented, there aren't as many tutorials, and pretty much nobody is talking about it. Everything is iOS based, it is Swift based, it is developed for the iPhone or the iPad and the Mac tends to be neglected. So, what are our sources for documentation? These are pretty much books, books, more books and Apple's documentation. So, <laughs> yeah, um, not many blogs, not many uh, Ray Wenderlich tutorials. Ray does have a few tutorials on getting started with macOS and AppKit, but there isn't the breadth that there is for iOS. So a lot of stuff you will have to try and piece together by yourself. Unfortunately, this is just the nature of it and something that has to be lived with. So if you hear about people talking about the big nerd ranch book, get yourself the latest copy, read it. It'll explain a whole heap of things. Um, books, physical copies, digital copies are going to be your friend as far as references. Not much has really changed in app kit like the general basics and structure of things recently so yeah books are the best option as well as apple's documentation now this slide is probably an offensive one to some people um, but when you're getting started with app kit or even ios mvc Apple's default architecture 
is actually a very, very good way of going about things. There is nothing sort of special or different you need to be thinking about. You just have a model, a view and a controller and you break things down as much as you want from there. It is a very easy and a very good straightforward way of achieving things. So that's the basics as far as sort of what I'm trying to go about explaining in a roundabout way. Um, now let's sort of look at some of the bits and pieces that are going to make up a Mac OS app. The first of those is this idea of a window. So who here knows about a window, as in a UI window in iOS? A fair few people, that is good. It's not really a thing in iOS apps in that you just assume there is a single window which is the window of your device. I've overheard people saying, oh, in order to do this thing I've presented another window on top of a window yeah, to Dub Dub Lab, and you just see people face palm and you go, no. That is very different in a macOS world because your apps are windows. So you've got the box which is your window and it has a view which is as a view controller and there are multiple views within it. You all know what a desktop app looks like. That is a window being presented. Now, your app can present multiple windows. That is a perfectly fine thing to do and something that is often expected. So, what is a window and a window controller responsible for? It is responsible for the document. I'll get to this idea of a document in the next slide. It contains your views and your view controllers. And, as I said, there can be more than one. NS document. So who here has played around with UI document? Yep, and you all know how horrible and painful that is to use. NS document isn't like that. NS document is actually very nice to use and it'll end up being your best friend. Why is it going to be your best friend? Because everything on a desktop is pretty much a file. You're dealing with files all of the time. You're not dealing with, I'll just post web requests and get stuff back. You're dealing with data that typically sits on a disk. So if you then want to get representation of a file that is useful pre presenting in a window, NS document is the way you go about it. NS document gives you your uh, file reading, file writing, renaming, everything. And Apple's documentation is the best option. NS view. So again, iOS, you have UI view. Everything is sort of represented in different views. On Mac OS apps, you have NSView. But uh, there are a few differences. In Mac OS, your coordinate system is not in the top right, as it is with an iOS device. Sorry, top left. It is in the bottom left. So it starts from there, and you then go positive in each direction, like a graph. The other thing is there are no, by default, there is no layer backing to an NS view. Everything is part of the views and I'll show a few things around that later. NS box. So who has done like old school Java swing interfaces from uni days? Yeah. <laughs> And typically you would sort of get a group of views and you'll like put an edge around it 
and you put a title. That's what Enter's box is. But you don't need to worry about the outline or the title on it all the time. Enter's box is actually a very good way of grouping a whole heap of views into one sort of thing that you then go about and modify or use. In a cell, everyone seems to have an opinion on this, good or bad. Um, I thankfully have not had to deal with NSL in anger just yet. Um, it sort of shows how new to macOS development I am, but it is something to look out for. NS Grid View. This is something I like. So we have stack views in iOS, which allows you to lay out something either vertically or horizontally. NS Grid View is a new thing in macOS. I believe it came in Sierra, I think maybe. People are nodding half-heartedly. Yep, okay. Um, and it allows a two-dimensional stack view. So you can la lay things out in rows and columns. This is really, really good and I like it. It's pretty cool. This one, the NS outline view is something you don't have in iOS. In macOS, um, if you think sort of old school representing of say, a file structure in a view, you've sort of got this tree format. Or even in Xcode, on the left-hand side, you've got your groups and your files and all that. That's something like an outline view. So instead of just having a straight table or a collection, you can have something that acts a bit more like a tree. I tried playing around with this years ago and went back when I was first sort of playing around with stuff and the ideas of delegates and data sources confused me then. But realistically, that's how a lot of app kit stuff, a lot of UI kit stuff works, is this idea of delegates and data sources. So. These guys are your friends. Um, they're the building blocks of most of Apple's, as far as I can tell, maybe wrong, um, actual architecture and design. Uses data sources for getting everything and then delegates for saying stuff has actually been done. It has been around for a while. I don't know when the idea or the pattern was first introduced, but it is pretty damn good and I think it should be adopted a lot more. If you're wanting to sort of understand UIKit and AppKit and how they behave, delegates and data sources are good options for really trying to get your head around because they're used everywhere. Collection views. Again, very similar to how UI Collection View works. I think NS Collection View actually came about after UI Collection View. So this is something where um, AppKit has adopted from iOS. And it's pretty cool. So there are similarities and there are differences. Apple's documentation is really good on this. So go read it. Table views. Again, much the same. You're laying everything out sort of one underneath the other. But with, okay, with um, table views, you've got this idea of double clicking, which you don't have in iOS. In iOS, it's always a single tap as your interaction. In AppKit, you can double click something. So 
NS table view has all of the delegate callbacks for handling that as well. Um, you can use NS table view cell or NS cell. Pretty cool. This next thing is magic, um, view bindings. So in iOS, particularly when you're doing a uh, UI in Interface Builder, you have no way of sort of tying the interface directly back to say a key path or something like that in your model representation. In AppKit, you have view bindings and these, they are magic in that it will create the link from your UI and say, I want to go to this array controller or this collection and grab this particular key path. It is pretty damn cool and impressive. It's magic, magic is real, unicorns are real. Get used to it. Interface Builder. Um, controversial, but Interface Builder is awesome. Um, makes a lot of sense when doing Mac OS apps. It makes your life so, so easy, particularly with view bindings, storyboards, say friends. Just use it. Stop doing stuff in code. If you do it in code, it's a maintenance nightmare. Okay. Layer-backed NSView. So earlier I made reference to this idea that a view doesn't typically have a layer, and it doesn't. Um, your default for an NSView is without a layer. You can, though, say to your view, I want to be layer-backed, as in controlled more by the graphics hardware than the CPU, fun stuff like that. In iOS, we would typically do something like this. We would say view.layer, background color, set it like that. This, from what I know and understand, is a fairly big don't do in AppKit. People smarter than me will probably tell you why. I'm just starting to realize this. Um, I've done this many times in my code. It's don't stress about it, just realise you're not being as effective with everything as you could. One alternative I found on the Objective-C.io, um, this is old Objective-C.io before talk, um, and they did an AppKit article mentioned about doing views and particularly a background view like this. I think this is pretty cool. Okay, so one of the things to realise is that with AppKit, because it's been around for so long, there are many, many opinions. These are the things I've sort of realised by talking to people. Trust Apple. They probably know what's going on with Mac OS and how apps should interact a lot better than you do. So. If they say, do something in a particular way, do so. Second, don't try to work around AppKit. Try to make use of it. So if you find yourself doing a whole heap of dodgy hacks or something, you're probably going down the wrong path. Anything that's private, just don't use. Um, it's private for a reason. There's no guarantee about it. Just avoid it at all costs. And make sure you test everything. With the Mac OS app, whether it's unit testing, whether it is some other kind of testing, make sure you test as much as you can because there is far more ways to break stuff than there is an iOS app. Last slide, where to from here? So. I'm just starting out with AppKit, and it's pretty cool. I like it. Um, I would actually challenge everyone to think of a desktop app that they want and go about developing it, just learn it. It's great for understanding the 
how a desktop app works in relation to a, an iOS app, but it'll also give you a good understanding around how iOS and UI kit is meant to work because you'll see how it's a progression from AppKit. Um, as I said, I'm still learning this stuff, but it's pretty awesome, so go out and make some pretty awesome things. Thank you. Okay, question was, have I published anything on the Mac App Store? How is it different from the iOS App Store? Yada, 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 big, long, we probably should get Sean up here to answer this as he's much more knowledgeable than I am. Having said that, my intention with my current side project is to publish on the Mac App Store. I think for a very sort of small and focused app, not to say that other apps aren't focused, but rather for what I'm wanting to achieve, I think uh, as a side project, as an indie dev, ha having the Mac App Store is a very, it's an amazing thing and it allows me to reach a lot more people than just publishing elsewhere. That's probably all I can say on it. Any other questions? Luke? Uh, you, you mentioned the NSL. I'll just give you a little bit of history about it. It's a really lightweight NSU. And the reason that they initially put it in was they wanted to make a calculator app. And machines at the time didn't have enough RAM to actually have every, bu every button for the calculator as an actual button. So that's why NSL and things like that. So you, you've got to remember that App kit goes back to like 1984. Yeah. Really like that. Um, with the next, that's where NS comes from. This next step, and things like NSL, it's like think of a, a machine with a 25 megahertz processor and four megahertz RAM. So yeah. It's yeah. yeah. Fast. yeah. <laughs> Absolutely. So, 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 so the iPhone is just like it just wastes most of its power. 25 megahertz. It's a luxury. They started with the 111, which is a one megahertz, one megahertz RAM. <laughs> 